live in a universe teeming with unexplained mysteries. From the origins of life, to the nature of dark matter, to the fate of Amelia Earhart, to that thing on the bottom of my foot. It's, it hadn't gotten darker or, or bigger or anything, but it's gotten like, I don't know, angrier? That's the best way I can describe it. It's gotten angrier somehow. I think it's judging me. Anyway, the history of science and technology is basically one of building new tools to solve these mysteries. And in recent years, we've created possibly the most powerful tool we've ever created. That is, of course, artificial intelligence. I mean, after all, if your own intelligence isn't enough to solve a problem, just make a new one. So today we're going to take a look at some of the biggest science mysteries that AI could help solve. And probably sooner than you think. Artificial intelligence was obviously the big buzzy thing this last year. Hell, I actually put it at number one in my video of the top science stories of 2023. Uh, and most of the buzz around AI really has been around how it's either really great for business or really terrible for society. Or both. But what doesn't get talked about nearly enough is how the integration of AI is changing our understanding of the world, solving problems we couldn't solve before, including solving some mysteries. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about just asking ChatGPT who was the Zodiac killer, because obviously ChatGPT hallucinates and could say something crazy like Ted Cruz, <laughs> which we all know that's not true. But there are some pretty compelling uses of AI that have already happened and more that are going to be coming in the near future. So let's just take a look at some of the more interesting ones. Let's start with medicine. A UN report from 2019 said that the death toll from drug resistant infections could rise to 10 million by 2050. Yeah, I've talked about this in previous videos that we kind of overdid it with the antibiotics and, and now there's many strains of bacteria that have evolved and become resistant. Um, the bugs have outsmarted us, basically. So the question is, um, the mystery, if we want to stay on theme, is can we create a universal antibiotic that is not susceptible to resistance? Because we need antibiotics for sure, but we also don't need the superbugs that they can accidentally create. And that's where AI comes in. Okay, so back in 2020, MIT researchers used a machine learning algorithm to find a new antibiotic compound. And in fact, this compound was able to kill several of the world's most deadly bacteria, including those resistant to all antibiotics. They basically made a computer model that was able to screen over 100 million chemical compounds in just a few days. As team lead James Collins told MIT News, quote, We wanted to develop a platform that would allow us to harness the power of artificial intelligence to usher in a new age of antibiotic drug discovery. Our approach revealed this amazing molecule, which is arguably one of the more powerful antibiotics that has been discovered. Okay, here's how it worked. The team had the AI model search for molecules whose physical structure could kill E. coli, and they trained it on around 2,500 molecules, including about 1,700 FDA-approved drugs, as well as 800 natural products. They then tested the model on the Broad Institute's Drug Repurposing Hub, which is a library of around 6,000 compounds. And the model discovered one very promising molecule that was different from any previous antibiotics, and they named it Halicin, after Hal from 2001. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. So they tested Halicin in a lab against a wide variety of bacteria, and it killed almost everything, including many that were usually resistant to treatment. Actually, the only one that it couldn't kill was called Pseudonomas aeruginosa. I looked it up. It's actually a bacteria that causes infections in hospital patients, usually blood infections and pneumonias. Now, all those tests were done in petri dishes, but they also tested it on mice infected with A. baumani, which is specifically a strain that's resistant to every known antibiotic. But within 24 hours, their infection was completely cleared up. So, pretty promising. And the way it works is interesting, or at least I think it's interesting. I'm not an expert on antibiotics, but in this case anyway, it's the structure of the molecule that does the work. The study says that Hallison kills bacteria by interrupting their ability to maintain an electrochemical gradient across their cell membranes. So yeah, that molecule just kind of attaches itself to the outside of the cell membrane, and because of the structure of that molecule, it kind of destabilizes the membrane and just frags the cell. And the cool thing about it is that that actually makes it harder for the bacteria to develop a resistance. In fact, they tested it against E. coli for 30 days and saw no resistance at all. And E. coli is kind of notorious for quickly developing resistances. Even better, Hallison could be a possible treatment for diabetes. Um, it, I couldn't find exactly how. It doesn't say any specifics, but it's, still, that's cool. Now, what I don't know, and I couldn't find anything on this, was whether or not it only works on harmful bacteria or if it could also like wipe out good bacteria, because as you know, our, our gut microbiome is super important and just wiping all that out is no bueno, uh, unless you're just into fecal transplants. 
So anyway, that's one AI solution. There's actually a totally different one that was discovered by researchers at the University of Pennsylvania's Machine Biology Group. Um, I actually talked about this in my de-extinction video a little while back, but they basically took sequenced genome data from Neanderthals and Denisovians, and then used AI to find potential antibiotics from that. So these are obviously extinct human species from hundreds of thousands of years ago, so they called this process molecular de-extinction. Yeah, basically they trained an AI model to predict which molecules would be effective antibiotics for humans. Then they let the AI do its thing, and once they found the best candidate, they created a molecule in a lab, they tested it out on mice, and yeah, it was actually really good at fighting out bacterial infections. As biochemistry professor Jonathan Stokes told Vox in 2023, quote, I think this technique will augment other antibiotic discovery efforts to help us discover structurally and functionally novel antibacterial therapies that overcome existing resistance mechanisms. Now let's talk about some archaeological mysteries that might be able to get solved thanks to AI, and there's some really exciting stuff happening here, um, if you enjoyed history and archaeology stuff, like moi. I did a video fairly recently on the South American quipus and how it's kind of like a lost language that people are finally starting to decode. Well, that's just one of dozens of ancient languages that have been found and never deciphered, and one of the most notorious is Linear A. So in 1886, a British archaeologist named Arthur Evans was excavating some ancient ruins on the island of Crete, and one of the things they found were several stone tablets, and those tablets had a couple of different scripts on them. And they named the scripts Linear A and Linear B. Uh, Linear A is older, from when the Minoans were on the island during the Bronze Age, and Linear B came later, when the Mycenaean Greeks took over. And Linear B has been decoded. Uh, it was actually figured out in 1952 by Michael Ventris and Alice Kober. Turns out it was an early form of the Greek language. Now, obviously, it had a lot of similarities to a known language, and if you have similarities to a known language, that helps. Linear A, on the other hand, doesn't look like anything. And, and yeah, it's older, from like 1800 to 1400 BCE. And so far, nobody has deciphered it. Now, that's partly because it doesn't look like anything else, but also because there's only a handful of fragments, so it's kind of hard to find correlations or patterns. But if there's one thing AI is good at, it's finding patterns. You might actually notice a pattern of me saying that in this video. So a team from MIT and Google's AI lab created a system to see how well machine learning could decipher a language, and they actually used Linear B as a test. As they told MIT Technology Review in 2019, quote, we were able to correctly translate 67.3% of Linear B cognates into their Greek equivalents in the decipherment scenario. To the best of our knowledge, our experiment is the first attempt at deciphering Linear B automatically. Their system works by determining relationships between languages, so it basically just kind of figured it out the same way that Ventress and Cobra did in 1952. Only, you know, in minutes. But their next goal is to decipher a language without comparing it to an already known language, just, you know, through the patterns in the text. So, with any luck, we'll finally be able to learn just what those Minoans were writing about way back then. Now, there's another historical mystery that AI is helping to solve, and it actually happened since we've been working on this script. So, you know about Pompeii, probably because of that little incident that occurred with the volcano and the mass death and the city buried in ash, that thing? Well, that bad day didn't just happen to Pompeii, it also devastated the city of Herculaneum. And among the rubble of Herculaneum are a set of papyrus scrolls that were found in a royal home. Scrolls that were not only singed by the flames of Vesuvius, but then smashed flat under tons of ash. They're in bad shape. Also, you're welcome for me uh, pronouncing it papyrus, because half of you glitched out in my Cylinder Seals video and I said it a different way. Cylinder Seals finally fell out of fashion sometime after 1000 BCE when papyrus took over. And papyrus took over. <laughs> But yeah, apparently some archaeologists tried to open some of the scrolls once upon a time, but it just disintegrated into dust so bad that they were just like, nope, and uh, yeah, they had to find a different way of looking into it. And one of the reasons why it's important to them to get into these scrolls is because this royal house I mentioned um, may have actually been the home of Julius Caesar's father-in-law. So maybe he spilled the tea about Caesar's bad table manners or something, or complained about the color palette of his interior design choices. Or maybe sheds light on some important historical event. It's possible. This was a huge library. I, I just told it like, I'm, I said it was like just some guy's house. There were 600 scrolls. It was an actual library that this guy had. And they're being stored in museums all around the world. Some were in good enough condition to translate and were found to be works from philosophers like Epicurus. But in an attempt to get inside these scrolls without destroying them, a team of researchers led by Dr. Brent Seals pioneered a process called virtual unwrapping using x-ray CT scanners. They first did this successfully for some scrolls that were found in Israel, but the ink that was used on those scrolls was lead-based, so it was denser than the carbon-based ink that was used in the Herculaneum papyri. Uh, it was basically charcoal-based ink. But anyway, without going into all the details, because that's not the point of this video, they basically used a particle accelerator in the same way to kind of 3D map these scrolls with resolution down to the 
four to eight micrometers per voxel. A voxel is a 3D pixel, so like a pixel volume voxel. So they took all this data and they made it public through a competition they created called the Vesuvius Challenge, which I'm pretty sure they stole from a drinking game I played in college. But anyway, they opened this up to software developers to create algorithms that can find patterns, see more patterns, uh, in the data that they provided to help decipher the scrolls. And each of them had a series of cash prizes for the people who can figure it out. And in October of 2023, the first of those prizes was accomplished when a college student named Luke Ferreter from the University of Nebraska created a machine learning algorithm that deciphered the first full word in the scroll. And the word in question was the ancient Greek word for purple. Maybe it was about Caesar's interior design. Actually, according to the journal Nature, purple dye was highly sought after in ancient Rome and was made from the glands of sea snails. So it may be referring to the color or maybe the snails, or maybe it's just describing someone's rank, like somebody who can afford purple. The point is that's just the first word, but yeah, it is a proof of concept that you know AI could help unlock the contents of old scrolls that previously couldn't be opened. Um, who knows, there might be a day when a scroll gets found and they can just kind of scan it and interpret it just like any other document. And this would be a massive boon to the entire field of archaeology. Now let's move on to astronomy, which I don't think it's a big surprise that AI can help in a lot of ways in this department, especially when it comes to exoplanets. There are now more than 5,000 confirmed exoplanets since the first one was discovered in 1992. And those are for the most part the, the easy ones to find, you know, big planets that pull on their stars, transiting planets. We can do that without AI, although AI will obviously be tremendously helpful on that as well. But one thing we've always struggled to visualize, though, is exoplanets in the formation stage, because mostly they're covered by thick clouds of gas. But AI could help overcome these challenges. A recent study from the University of Georgia showed how machine learning could help find these exoplanets that are still forming. It's a proof of concept where researchers use exclusively synthetic telescope data that a computer has simulated and then use it to train AI, and then use that to apply it to data from real telescopes. Which, as study co-author Cassandra Hall said, quote, this has never been done before in our field and paves the way for a deluge of discoveries as James Webb telescope data rolls in. One of the other researchers described it as basically creating a better person. Um, but yeah, no, currently scientists analyze data from hundreds of images looking for a specific type of disk. And you know, sometimes it's easy to overlook a wiggle in the images because they're tiny or the image isn't clean. But using AI is faster, more accurate, also saves money. Or as lead author of the study Jason Terry puts it, quote, there remains within science and particularly astronomy in general, skepticism about machine learning and of AI, a valid criticism of it being this black box where you have hundreds of millions of parameters and somehow you get out an answer. But we think we demonstrated pretty strongly in this work that machine learning is up to the task. And it's not just exoplanets that AI can help find, it can also discover brand new things, like when astronomers used it to find an odd radio circle that they named Sauron. Yeah, that stands for a steep and uneven ring of non-thermal radiation. <laughs> There's like three words in there that don't even show up in the acronym, but... No! What the astronomers did was they created a coding framework called Astronomaly to help them go through the data from the Meerkat radio telescope. Yes, Meerkat found Sauron. Science. As you can probably guess, the purpose of Astronomaly is to find astronomical anomalies. So basically, instead of having to go through 6,000 images themselves, their framework kind of helped narrow down their choices to 200 or so images of anomalies. And within the first 60 images, they found this thing that they named Sauron. Now they just need to figure out what it is exactly they found, but who knows what else they might find. Last but not least is one of the biggest possible mysteries in science, and that is the mystery of how consciousness works. This is a complicated topic, but just for simplicity, let's talk about the easy problem and the hard problem of consciousness. The easy problem of consciousness basically explains how and why we do things. It's how brains perform cognitive tasks and run our meat suit. And then there's the hard problem of consciousness. That's explaining how and why we feel things. And there are no physical laws to explain this. And as AI becomes more and more advanced, we'll see them start to encroach on both the easy and hard levels of consciousness. And that's gonna teach us a lot about how our own brains work. Maybe even at some point they'll come to grapple with the hard problem of consciousness. And being that they can calculate and analyze and perform at a much higher rate than us, who knows? Maybe it'll figure it out before we do. But hey, it wouldn't be science if it didn't bring up just as many questions as it answers. So yeah, there's actually a lot of mysteries around AI itself. For example, we teach learning algorithms the same way we teach children, basically. You know, just feed the system examples of something you wanted to recognize, and over time it'll create its own network, neural network, if you will to categorize these new things. But just like human learning, we don't really understand how deep machine learning works either. 
it actually winds up losing track of all the inputs that helped it out with the decisions, or it may never keep track of them at all. And not knowing this is the black box problem that was mentioned before. And there's some reasons why it's important. One is that it just makes it hard for us to fix deep learning systems if they don't put out the outcomes that we want. And then there's the ethics behind all that because, I mean, deep learning systems are being used to make decisions about human beings all the time for things like medical treatments, bank loans, job interviews. But they can also reflect the biases of the humans that work with them. And the thing is, the systems can't explain why they do what they do, so that's why they kind of seem like it's not fair. There are some that think the whole black box thing is exaggerated. As Princeton computer scientist and professor Arvind Narayanan tweeted in 2023, quote, We have fantastic tools to reverse engineer them. The barriers are cultural, building things as seen as cooler than understanding, and political, funding for companies versus for research on societal impact. And by the way, there are some that claim that saying that we don't know how it works is just a way to avoid responsibility and that we should find a way to know how it works. Either way, AI is becoming more enmeshed in our daily lives, and while it may solve some of our biggest mysteries and problems, which is great, obviously, it may just wind up being the biggest mystery of all. One thing that's not a mystery is how you can eat fast, delicious, and healthy meals every day with today's sponsor, Factor. Okay, so look, people ask me all the time whether I actually use the sponsors that I promote on here, and the truth is I do, some more than others, but with Factor, I am a legit customer. I actually do pay for this service. I get a box from them uh, every week, which means that when I do get a sponsorship from them and they send me their little sample box, um, my fridge is literally overflowing with the stuff. And I'm kind of fine with that. The thing I like about Factor is it's like ordering takeout because it's actually good, like restaurant quality food. And they're actually healthy because they're prepared with the help of dietitians. It's also faster than waiting on takeout to get delivered to you and it's way less expensive. Literally two minutes in a microwave and boom, you're eating. It's, it's the quickest way to grab some lunch outside of just not eating lunch. They've got 35 different meals you can choose from each week and get them to fit your meal plan, be it keto, vegan and veggie, calorie smart, you name it. Plus they've got 55 different add-ons you can put on there, including smoothies and protein shakes, which are amazing. So look, it's the new year. You might be thinking about your health and fitness goals for this year and how you eat is just a really big part of that. And getting factor is just one less thing for you to worry about. It's delicious, it's actually good for you and you don't have to spend three hours a week doing meal prep. So it's, it's definitely worth a try. And if you want to give it a try, just click on the link in the description. You can get 50% off your first order. It's a great deal for you, and yes, it does support the channel. So yeah, go give it a try. You'll get 50% off your first box. Link's down in the description. All right, thanks for watching, and a big shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members who are helping to keep the lights on around here, forming an awesome community. I say the same thing every week, but I really do appreciate you guys so much. There's, there's some new members I want to call out real quick. We got DD Sharf. Varga Silvester, I think, <laughs> Juliana Grandianetti, uh, Michelle Purcell, Debbie Lemons Hall, Nathan Roberson, Eric Messer, German Musketeer, Paul Reap, and Tom Hewitt. Uh, thank you guys so much. And if you would like to join them, get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and uh, yeah, just, just be, be one of the cool people with a little thing by your name and, and stand out in the comments. You'll be special. Uh, just hit the little join button down below. I appreciate it. I do want to say thanks for sticking around for this video. I know my voice is a little rough. I've been sick lately. Uh, there's like a half ton of stuff bricking up the plumbing in my face. And you can probably hear that, but uh, I appreciate you watching this one. But please do like and uh, share this video if you liked it. If you've never watched one of my videos before, hi, how you doing? I'm Joe. Uh, but you can maybe find any of my other videos that are like being shared. If Google is being nice to me and sharing it on the side over here, go take a look. If you enjoy it, I invite you to subscribe because I do come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. I'm going to go drain my face. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.